Hey there, guys. Welcome to the Home Service Expert. I'm your host, Tommy Mello, and today I have Ryan Groth with me. He's an expert in sales, training, and systems. He's located in a special spot that I wish I was in. Uh, well, actually, right now, Arizona's good, too, but we he's out of Kulu, Hawaii. Uh, he's the CEO of Sales Transformational Group Incorporated. He's a board member at Roofing Technology Think Tank, and he also has been the president and COO of Follow Up CRM. Ryan Groth, founder of Sales Group tra uh, Sales Trans Transformation Group, is a family man, former professional baseball player, and a sales trainer helping the construction industry move from reactive to proactive and build winning sales teams. Growing up with his mom and dad's custom home building company, Ryan saw the highs and lows of a family business. After he played professional baseball and transitioned to his career, he connected with an innovative commercial roofing contractor who wanted to sell a sales management CRM program. After Ryan implemented the system, he found that his passion for coaching and training the people using the system was the key to create results. His coaching skills took off, and that's how Transformational Group Incorporated was birthed. His high energy and authentic approach has helped him partner with hundreds of teams and creating high-performing sales producers. There's nothing that I love talking about more than sales. So let's do this, Ryan. Tell us a little bit about you and uh, about your life and where you're headed. Yeah. So uh, thanks for having me on, Tommy. And it's good to be here. Yeah. I mean, uh, for me, I'm just all, all, all about growth. You know, where's the next level of growth? I think success for me is defined by being faithful to just grow everything you've been given, every opportunity in front of you. So for me, I'm just, uh, you know, we're are entering our fifth year at STG is what we call sales transformation group. We're, you know, over 600 clients nationwide, and we're just uh, empowering and inspiring our team to just make a huge impact and, uh, you know, make a lot of money and help a lot of people. But yeah, uh, a little bit about us is you, you kind of share the background there, you know, played, played uh, collegiately, professionally in baseball. My parents are in the industry. I saw them struggle and, um, got a chance to play at a high level and competitively. And so I think the inner athlete in me and in all of us wants to compete, wants to grow, wants to win, wants to, you know, win when the, when, you know, when the scoreboard is not in your favor and you overcome and you, you find a lot of value in growing and competing and dominating something that you go after. So when I found out about this industry and sales and I saw the, all the opportunity, I was like, this feels like a calling to me. And so what I love to do is just um, is just build teams and help our teams build teams in this trade that makes it attractive. I mean, I, I think uh, I want people to grow up and say, I don't want to go work and be a doctor. I want to go work for, you know, do garage doors or uh, roofing or HVAC because there's just so much money, so much opportunity, so little real competition, in my opinion. Like, and I think that's changing, but I think there's so little real competition and I'd rather see people, uh, you know, see people succeed, you know, thrive, make a ton of money, help their families be successful. I mean, there's so much that I love about this, that what we do. The bottom line, sales is the secret, is the key. And uh, the skills to develop those, scale, those, those sales is the key to the transformation of someone's business and life. Without that, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what product you're pushing, how many crews you have or don't have, you got to be able to sell and sell value at a high margin consistently to grow. So, yeah, where I'm going today is just more of that, you know, and um, enjoying my boys. I got four kids. We live in Hawaii. We got a couple acres, beautiful view, you know, love my family and just just trying to uh, set them up to be even more successful than I. Well, I love that. You know, you, you said there's no real competition for the most part. I agree. But, you know, you get these white collar guys. I, I got a master's degree, which means nothing. Um I've learned way more in the home service business than, than I did in that degree, but it's not easy. I, I see a lot of smart operators um, in the HVAC world and they say, Oh my God, HVAC so much more difficult. Roofing so much more difficult. I'm like, well, in my industry, there's no one else even close to my size. If you shit the bed, you'll do 20 million a year in HVAC. If you shit the bed big time and diarrhea everywhere, You'll do 25 million in a roofing business. You're if you're really, really good at garage doors, you do five million. So I love it when people say, Yeah, mm -hmm. dude, anybody can do garage doors. I'm like, you know, the 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 key I see now when COVID hit, I think the big impacted area was 
taking great care of your people, taking yeah. amazing care, making sure they make more than a plumber, more than a roofer, more than an HVAC tech. You know, I know certain guys make five, 600 grand out there in sales, which is fine for me. I got guys that'll do that too, probably this year. They, they've never hit half a million dollars yet. But what do you think this last year or two, I just see the dynamics of business changing drastically. Like, like it's a new game. Inventory is an issue. Finding great people, getting good trucks, um, building systems, CRM. Wh when do I sh switch technologies? Uh, some people say, man, I'm really ha ha happy with Jobber or House Call Pro. Do I need Service Titan? What are your thoughts on all those questions? It, it's a loaded question. Yeah, I mean, what I saw COVID do was it exposed who are – uh, what kind of the real leaders and entrepreneurs are in the space, you know, people who can pivot, people who can take action, people who can implement technology. I think people who didn't implement technology quickly got, got hurt. Um, and, you know, if, if I think people made slow decisions and it's it caught up to them, you gotta be, you know, I think what we saw is the people who know how to take action fast, and also what I, what I hear a lot of people struggling with is, is finding good help. Um, to me, man, like it's all about, if you can't find good help, you, you're not a leader that knows how to inspire people and are willing to invest in people. That's what I'm seeing is like people who really want to invest in people grow I think a, a lot of the smaller guys who never spent a lot of money on a CRM or a training program or, or hired a senior leadership team, they're, they're starting to, they get, a, they get afraid. They're like, you know, stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. Right. But the ones who know how to invest in people, technology training, yeah, they know that even if they get a small portion immediately and they are committed to it, to seeing it through long-term, they're going to have huge upside. And so when someone's like, I can't find good help, that's a huge red flag that that person doesn't understand the dynamics it takes to lead and cast amazing vision and invest and put your money where your mouth is in the vision in which you're casting with talent. Cause so I think if you're a good leader, you could find, um, you can find a lot of people wanting to work for you. And in fact, here's how, you know, you're creating a good culture is when investing in people is when your own people are like, bro, like, this is my brother, this is my friend, or this is my friend I went to, this is my college roommate. And like, they're looking for a place to call home and I found home here and I want them to come with me. And that means, you know, I look at what I love about that is it actually makes them want to work even harder because they're more accountable to making this work because now they have somebody that they're relationally invested into in their life in the company too. So there's a lot of upside to that. But I think that leaders got exposed and the real ones rose up and gobbled it up, dude. The real ones rose up and just crushed because they put the pedal to the metal while everybody else is tapping the brakes. You know, that's an interesting, it's a great, great vision that you, it's exactly what happened. You know, I, I think about this though. Um, I'm a, I don't know whether I like marketing or sales better because they're kind of yin and yang and I love marketing. And I think about marketing is three things for me. It's getting great, amazing customers, but it's also finding internal clients and internal customers, which are our employees and it's finding businesses to buy. So those three things, and, and, and we've got a budget for each of those. And it's not, you know, what I find is someone saying, I'm like, how much did you spend last month in marketing? $10 million company, $12 million company, let's say. Well, I spent ten percent. She spent one hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars, or whatever it comes out to be. It comes out to be a hundred thousand um, dollars. You spent a hundred grand, okay? How much did you spend finding great people? You know, we do some stuff on Indeed. We do a little bit of Zip Recruiter. We posted a couple of Craigslist ads. Probably a thousand bucks. So you spent a hundred grand to get clients, mm -hmm. and on your internal customers, you spent a thousand, so a one hundredth. Mm -hmm. And you wonder why you're getting nobody. Everybody's marketing for people right now. And here's another little thing that I picked up on is uh, you might have Margaret. Margaret doesn't, she's not on Facebook. She's not on Instagram. She doesn't know what TikTok is. But Margaret volunteers at her church. And her church has a 2,000 person congregation. And if she were to speak up there, she just doesn't know how to. She doesn't know how to get credit for it. 
And she doesn't have anybody asking her to do it. So I think every single person has a talent. Somebody's really outgoing, but doesn't love social media. Get them in a BNI group and say when they do their one minute elevator pitch, you know, a great referral for me is not a client. Of course, anybody that needs a garage door would be a client of ours. Send them my way. But I'm looking for people that have a will, that got a great attitude, that want to learn a trade where they can make great money. If they got a smile on their face and they want to win and succeed and go up the corporate ladder, we're not a corporation, but that's what we say. They want to move up quick. This is the place, man. This these guys are moving and shaking. It's fun every day. They feed yeah. you. You'll have a good time. They got all you know the benefits and all that jazz. But it's really fun to work there. Yeah, that's my minute. So if you guys know anybody, and I'll pay you to do it. You guys bring a referral to me. They pay me. I, I want to make ten ten grand a month. So you guys need to find me ten people. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, I just love this stuff. Man. You know, it's 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 it, it's really wild, man. Like, and we started to do. Uh, like, you know, you got marketing funnels or videos to attract customers. And um, we we started doing that where we create like positions of the, in the, like the role, the way you can grow in the company on a video, like a 30 minute video, like transparent. Here's our core values. Here's where we were. Here's where we started. Here's, you know, Tommy Mello and his background. Here's a little bit about his family. Here's a senior leadership team. Here's a track record. Here's a case study of so-and-so who's had success, who's in sales, making 300 grand in year two or whatever. And people are doing marketing videos to acquire new customers, but they're not doing marketing videos to uh, bring on people. And I tell you what, man, like we turn that video on and it's amazing the kind of people that I come through because then they got to watch the video and then they got to go through an application. Then you can have some kind of screening test. They're two hours invested into looking at the opportunity and wanting to work there. And they're telling you why they wouldn't work for you versus you convincing them that they should work for you. And uh, you just got to pivot. And I think that's marketing and sales, you know, which I think marketing is sales in written form or in, you know, some video form or branded form. But yeah, uh, it's, it's wild. And uh, I remember when I brought on some of our senior leaders um, and I was a good marketer. And I think we are good marketers, but I remember we were having some issues internally. We have people feeling disconnected. We're a completely remote company. And you think I got 20 employees in Maui, you know, no, we, uh, they're all over the country. And I remember we had our, uh, our annual big event, STG live, which is our big annual conference. And we had one of our admins just started crying. <laughs> it was like, she was like, I just feel so disconnected. You said I did a good job. That's the first time I've heard that. And it was a, it was convicting for me because of the distance in the, in the remote world. But bottom line is my uh, our president, I'm CEO, my president, Adam, he goes, bro, we're crushing it market facing. Internally, we're struggling. Like we're not crushing it internally, right? So it's like we had to start to change the culture internally, just speaking out, you know, from our experience. Um really investing into our people and marketing to our people. And now we got people referring like, Oh, I got my best friend. Oh, my dad should work here. Oh. And then that is such a powerful thing. Cause like customer attrition and seeing like new faces, customers seeing new faces all the time, new account managers, the ramping time, losing people. It, it's not, it's not a good look. Oh, I was at a one. Now they're putting on Facebook. I'm no longer at a one. It was a good run. And now I'm working for something else. It's like, you know, it, you want long-term employees that are bought in, right? You want people who are connected and um, it's going to, it's, I love that you're talking about that and you should, we should invest in marketing to our employees just as much as the well, customers. Well, you know, here's the way to stack the deck too, Ryan, if you really think about it, you ever heard of the dollar a day strategy on social media, you, you put a buck towards it and whichever one gets the most interaction is where you put it like a hundred bucks. And mm -hmm. then out of those, you put more, um, you test those videos out and then you have a way to syndicate it to all your employees. So we had over 400 people posting that they got a tracking cookie. Another thing is think about this, Ryan, in the home service space, my best technicians never wanted to leave their old job, but I'll tell you this dollar shave cup club, dollar beard club, you know, they advertise to the wives. Now, most of my people are male technicians. I have one female. She's amazing. Um, but if you really wanted to get them to change, get a wife out there to say this, you know, my husband, Ryan, he's a pretty good dad. Now he's an amazing dad. 
He was a pretty good husband. Now he's an amazing husband. We bought a house. We didn't own a house. We own our vehicles outright. We've got a better credit card score. But here's the one thing I can tell you guys. He feels appreciated and he's got a smile when he comes home. And he comes home earlier than he did before. He spends breakfast with us. He makes it to my kids' ball games and the dentist appointments. Never did that before. What do you think that means to a woman that's in a relationship? I think it means a lot. Powerful. They'll be switching jobs, man. They'll be switching careers. That's something we're really working on. I got the right, you got to have the right video guy and you can't overproduce it either. But this is a fun subject. Uh, you oh, know, I want to Dude, you're getting, you're taking, you're about to take your recruiting to a whole nother level. I could already see it. You already are. You probably already are, but it sounds. Well, look, what we're trying to do is get to a billion. I got to get to a billion by 2025. I made a $250,000 bet to hold myself accountable. So. Um, I love, what's motivating you to do that? I'm just curious. I just, I love it, but I'm just. So someone like, asked me the other day, what the hell's the deal? And I said, well, money's no longer ever going to be in my way. So I had to knock that one out first. I don't come from it really, really any money. So I wanted to get the money out of the way. And then I wanted to really understand business to a deeper level. And what I decided, I said, you know, if I really had to tell you, I want to be Neil Armstrong. I want to be the first of our kind. I want to be legendary. I want to leave a legacy so strong that when people see me, when I've got a grandson, he's going to go, hey, Billy, you ever hear of that thing called the garage door? Yeah, my grandpa. For me, that's what it is now. It's about leaving such a big mark. And really, what's the byproduct of that? It's helping hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions. And this is one step to what I want to do. I, I, I'm not... Look, I'm not Elon Musk, but I really look up to that guy because he's number one. And so it starts in the home service place, space, make an impact, be the Neil Armstrong. There's other chapters in my book that are not written yet, but uh, I know where we're going with them. So, you know, and, and I say all the time, um, what did Peter Parker's uncle, Spider-Man, tell him with great power comes great responsibility. If you could, you should, because you could help a lot of people. Uh, I definitely feel like we could. We've got an amazing team. I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants with the amazing group we have here. So we're ready to just go dominate. And uh, I, I tell people we're playing chess and everyone else is playing checkers, but I invite people into our shop all the time. In fact, we started a new thing up called garage door freedom. We've got about 25 people companies joining. We'll take these companies from 3 million to 10 million in two years. And you know, when they write me every day and I can show you a million letters, handwritten letters, Facebook messages, LinkedIn messages, emails, text messages. You changed my life. And when you got enough people that you change their life, it seems like just good thing happens. And you put it all out there. I put it out there in the world and it came back. It comes back tenfold. You know, I had a comment here. One of the guys, well, first of all, Tom Brown seems to have a crush on you. No, I'm kidding. He likes you though. So this is good. Tim's an amazing guy. He's in the roofing industry. Yeah. Um, Chris DeGuire said, we are a four-person plumbing service shop. What is the first area of tech training to invest in? I mean, let's, talk, let's get them to sell. They can sell. They can upsell. They could sell on site. I, I'm imagining that that's uh, the, the service tech model, the sales model. You know, I, I would start there. And then you can decide as you get this thing pumping with some gas on sales, whether – if um, you know you should stick with that model or have a salesperson and then sell it and then hand it off to a tech to fulfill it, you can determine that model after you get some sales. But sales starts it all, right? Pump some freaking off. Without sales, you got no money, and without money, you can't get good recruiters. I think one thing I've identified with most business owners, including myself, we're not good interviewers until we start reading and learning and, and seeing it. Mm -hmm. A great interview is asking a lot of tough questions. Mm -hmm. Ryan, I'd ask you what this is. This is, I thought this was such a bad question until I understood what it means is tell me a little bit about some of the qualities that, that would make you a true team player, team player. And mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about what are some of the things that you've done in your past that really showed and exemplify that. And then secondly, I'd say, show me some things that you need to work on. Mm -hmm. And if you said, well, Tommy, the hardest thing about me is I work too hard. My wife tells me I'm one of the hardest workers and I just, I work all the time. You hear the stupidest answers. And what you want to hear is just, you know, Tommy, sometimes I take on too much. I'll tell you, sometimes I have a hard time 
distinguishing what's the most important thing. That's why I like to touch base with my direct report at mm -hmm. least once a week and make sure I stay focused on that because sometimes I do gobble up too much and nothing seems to get it done. So I like weekly checkups. That would be a true answer. You're just trying to see if they have some humility, you know? Totally. Totally. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you, you have to start becoming a good at interviewing and I love that. You know, I, I think, I think I, I was, you know, you guys, you've heard of the software keep K E A P. I have heard of it. I don't know much about it. Infusion soft was what it used to be. Oh yeah. No confusion soft. That's why they changed it to keep. Yeah. They used to be right down the street from here in Mesa. There's still yeah. Arizona. Yeah. It was funny. I mean, I, I actually, uh, and I was thinking a lot of this before, before I met them, but, I was uh, I was on a flight ha home to Maui, and uh, the CEO and his wife were right next to me. We were, you know, in first class, which is something that when you go that far, you got to go first class so you could get some good sleep. But man, we spent like two hours just talking life, business, family, and it was a it was a treat. I mean, the guys, you know, got a pretty solid software company. He's a CEO and founder, and um, and what he was talking about was just like how they used to do some core value workshops, but. They have their whole family. He's got core values. They got core values everywhere. But he's like, you you fire, coach, you hire, coach, and fire to your core values. So you hire, you coach, and you fire to your core values. Because if you if you don't interview within the context of your core values, I think you're missing it because then you can't coach to those core values. And then if something's off, aside from just pure underperformance or something morally or illegal that they did, you can't fire them, right? So I want to you know, we want to be in a place where we could say, look, we got five core values. You know, John is, he's having an off month. Like what's going on, right? Like what's happening? What's going on? He's, he's just, I don't feel like there's some, there's a rub. So then you can go back to the core values and, uh, and, and, and go back to it and see if what's missing. Right. And then if it's something that's never going to get developed or just it's over, then you could fire them based on that, you know, on that criteria. So I don't know if, you know, what you think about that, Tommy, but just like, core yeah, values well, as a kind of ingrained component of interviewing so there's a book i read last oh shoot yeah wednesday i haven't read it over three days it was an audio book i was reading a few at a time but one of the books is by um it's called the ideal team player the guy the same guy Patrick that wrote Lanciancy. Patrick yeah. Lanciancy. Yeah. and he says there's three qualities that you need in an employee hungry humble and smart and let me just, you could just go through these really, really quickly is humble means that's the question. What's your weakest flaw? You know, when you ask them, tell me a little bit about your accomplishments. If you're like, I, 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 but if you're like, listen, when I was in baseball, we had to work as a team. And the more times you hear team, that's great. Humble is just, listen, we missed the deadline and, and I'm going to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's actually taking ownership if it's right or wrong. Uh, hungry means, listen, I'll work nights, weekends. I want to get ahead. I want to win. I do want this. I'm going to put in the work it takes to be at the top. Right. But smart is not what it means. Smart is not like, oh, my gosh, I just passed the SATs or, or whatever, the DATs or the GMAT. Smart means that I have a good – I know what when I say something that people understand who I am and what I'm talking about. Smart means that I'm – when someone want when I'm having a one on one, I'm not condescending, but I'm aware of it. It means right. I'm street smart. It means I'm a new, good negotiator. It's it's like let's, let's I might say, Ryan, look, you haven't smiled all day. You don't seem like yourself. There's something going on. A smart person realizes that. Right. A non smart person that's not good with people just says, oh, they're quiet today, and they don't they don't really they don't grasp that. So those three qualities. Is really, I'd say, yes, I have core values and I live by those core values and ethics and, and a, a, aspire to be number one is my first core value. But these three really indemnify a great team player. And that's what I realized. Oh, yeah. that's you, what I, need. I read that book like seven years ago. And I don't know if I have it here. I just look it up. There's the image. There's some, you know, and it's, it talks about, so humble, hungry, smart, right? The ideal team player is the is all of it. But if you're smart and hungry, you're the skillful politician, right? Which means you're, you know, you're good with people. You can manipulate people and get them for your game, right? You're not like yep. serving others. It's for you. And then, which again, like 
And then you got hungry and humble, which means you're the accidental mess maker, which I thought was was interesting. So you're 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 like gonna make messes. Oh well, <laughs> you know, making mistakes all the time. You're not aware of your of others. And then you have smart and humble, and be, to, those two together is the lovable slacker. Yep. So, um, I thought that was really challenging for me because. Oh, and then if you just have one and not the other two, if you're straight hungry, you're the bulldozer. Yep. That was me. I'm like, I'm hungry. I don't give a crap. Like, I'm not that humble. And I, I'm just going to take this on. There's going to be some dead bodies, but I don't really care because I'm going to do what I want. Right. And then and then if you're just uh, smart, you're a charmer. And if you're just humble, then you're a pawn. So I was like, yeah. wow. You're, you're, the t- like, you're the one that gets all the work dumped on them. Right. And you're just sitting there. There's a lot of people like that. Taking it. Right. So what I found was that the humble piece, the smart piece need to work because I think down to the, you know, bad score of me was a bulldozer. Like you, I was hungry. I was always hardest worker, but I wasn't aware of myself and, and others. And then I was also concerned about myself a lot. Not very, you know, and just not as humble as I could have been. So what I did was it exposed my need to learn how to be more aware of my emotions? So I got the Emotional Intelligence 2.0 book by Travis Bradbury. And I think that book helps you become smart. I think, do you have it? I, I got another one called Strength Finder 2.0 that someone just got for me. But wow. um, emotion, it's called what? Emotional. Oh, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. So Tommy, what they do is, They make you buy, you can't just buy a copy and read it because you have, what they make you do is you got to buy a copy in order to get the code inside the book so that you can take the emotional intelligence test. Right. And so then you take it and I was like, wow, I need some work. And then they actually show you in the book, all of the different like examples of low scores, higher, and then really high scores. And then you're like, you start to see your gaps. You're like, wow. So anyway, I think that really helps you in sales too when you become emotionally aware because that you can like connect with people and be a little bit more um, strategic and smoother in your approach rather than just forcing, you know, forcing and, and pushing too hard. You can like care, care about people. They feel cared for, right? But ultimately, um, I wanted to share that, Tommy, that that book showed my gap of being smart as a real like true smart person and emotionally smart. And then I got that book and I think it closed that gap. You know, it's nice to know what you need to work on. One of the things I really recommend to people, and this is different. So I just want to clarify something that might be going on. And a lot of the listeners that really listen to me a lot is to be a better communicator is something we should all be working on at all times. Now, I always say I hire around my weaknesses and I don't work on becoming a great CPA or a great accountant Mm -hmm. because quite frankly, it doesn't drive me. I'm not motivated by doing it. I don't have fun. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of people that I never want to be the CTO. CMO, yes, I, I I like being involved in marketing. But, you know, at the end of the day, I've surrounded myself with every one of my weaknesses. But I can't find anybody to speak for me <laughs> and try to figure out emotional intelligence. So what I usually mean by hiring for my weaknesses, there's things that I'm always going to work on. I'm never going to stop working out. I'm never going to start stop trying to understand how to motivate people and that's emotional intelligence. And also just trying to pick up on people's cues. And Mm -hmm. I just read a whole book about body language and it has a lot to do with tonality, eye contact, Mm. but what it explains to us is there's four major things that we, we really, we identify when we meet a person and sex is one of them because as mammals, we're, we're, you know, back in the day, we just, that was one of the core things we needed to do. And that's part of, there's this mm-hmm. chart. I, I don't know if I, I want to show you guys a quick chart of, if I can show you this, let's see if this works. So can you see this chart? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Bro. Love so, this. So this is, this is called Maslow's hierarchy of needs and breathing food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, excretion. That Those are, first and then it goes all the way down to this and when you understand these things it's important so their sex is one of them the second one is if you're an enemy you recognize that very very quickly usually that's it's certain type of uh 
They want to kill you. <laughs> uh, number three is a friend. And number four is indifferent. And how do you move quickly from the indifferent stage into that friend mm -hmm. stage? And that's mm -hmm. what sales is all about. And, and so I not only been studying verbal communication and the words to use, never say cheap, say the most economical, never say cancel the right of rescission. Never say sign here. Say I need you to okay the paperwork. Never say contract. You know, it's simple. Say thing. agreement. Say agreement. 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 Yeah. So you go through all these, and I've got, I've got a lot of, uh, you know, there's a great book called um, uh, Influence, Influence, Maximum Influence that has all these words on a page. I'm actually building it into my training center. Well, let me ask you this. I want to get to some of these questions here that I, my team does all this work and I haven't asked one of these questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> what does a robust sales process look like? Yeah, I think a ro robust sales process looks like um, structured phases of the of the sales process itself. So breaking it out into, into different chunks so that there's awareness of the salesperson of where they are in the sales process. So they got to have some awareness through, through phasing it out. And then within each phase, there should be milestones that we want to accomplish. So for example, like we like to use a baseball diamond a lot. And one of our, especially our commercial sales training, where we go from home to first is they're on first base. They're a suspect first to second. They're a prospect. Second to third is their journey becoming from prospect to closable and qualified. And then from third to home is when they close. And so a lot of people, what they do is will say, oh, you're going from first to third, which means you're skipping the steps in between. So they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going from first to third, which means I'm showing up and throwing up. Right. I'm, I'm you know, quoting and hoping I'm getting in and I'm just going right to the close and I'm hoping they buy. Right. So I think a really great sales process, a robust one, needs to look like a set of milestones within the overall process that's laid out that questions support the achievement of those milestones. So, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I think people like to buy. They hate to be sold, right? People want it's a salespeople should be listening 80 percent of the time and talking 20 percent. They should be talking listening to the prospect. And the process, and if you can't, if you don't know how to get them to listen, well, you need to learn how to sell, which means you'll learn how to ask the right questions. And the, what we teach is if you're really good at sales, it means you're really good at asking questions. And if you're really good at asking questions, you'll know that by when a prospect says, man, Tommy, that's a great question. When you ask them the question, hey, you know, what, like, how do you know you asked a really good question when they say, man, that's a good question. Or how do you know if you ask a tough question and say, that's a tough question. So in sales, a robust sales process, if you're doing it right, should get them saying, wow, those are that's a great question. And then it should be touching on their emotional levers in the process that they're self-discovering through your questions. And then when you present a solution, you're only showing them what they've already convinced themselves they want to do rather than you convincing themselves to do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it when people ask me and they smile. And they go, "Well, what do you think?" <laughs> I'm like, I, and I, I'm the guy that's selling them. And, and one of the things I teach my guys is, I'm like, "Look, it's you and the client versus us. That you you got to sell a one, but it's got to be you and the client versus us." And one thing on my Mojo call this morning, I said, "There's one common trait that I'll tell each and every one of you right now." that I've heard from every guy that breaks through the invisible wall. They slow down. Mm -hmm. They're not in a race that the only thing on their minds when they're there is that client. Totally. They're not looking at their phone. They're not looking at their watch. And I say, there's this period in my mind of about two and a half hours where I'm talking about the Harley. I'm talking about snap on tools, uh, the wife. I'm talking about a lot of stuff. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're a teacher. I'm using their first or last name 15 times. I'm making them feel special. And there's certain ways that I'm just like, really? And then I use the not all the time. So you tell me you want your door to be safe. You care a little bit about the curve appeal. And you want to make sure you have a great warranty. What do you say we go over these options and we pick one right now? And, and it's it's very simple, these nonverbal cues. But there's there's so many people that are relationship 
sales. There's other people that know how to build instant rapport and get that sale done in the home right mm -hmm. then and there. And I don't think they're always the same people. That's a good call. That's a good call. And I like what you're saying there is in order for you to say that you wanted, you know, that they wanted a function, a curb appeal and a good warranty. I think I got one of those incorrect because I didn't listen as good as I should have. Um, that shows you're listening, right? When you share it back with them, it shows that the sales. Or you guy, write it down. We're, that's even better when you're writing these things down and you're like, really? You know, when I met Al Levy, I sat down at the restaurant with him and he goes, Tommy, I've met a lot of guys. He goes, very rarely do I see them taking notes because mm -hmm. that's a good sign. And you're right. You know, I met this master salesman for Valpac, those little blue coupons. Number one guy in the country. He goes, I got a rule. If I can get the customer talking more than 90%, he goes, it's always an hour long. He goes, so I shoot for 50 to 54 minutes. If I could get them talking 50 to 54 minutes, my closing rate's 100%. He goes, as I start to go 40 minutes, here's where my closing rate. And he showed me his closing rate as he had to talk more. Mm. And it's very interesting, you know, that that um, I got his book right over there, The uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Good guy. I met him a bunch of times. He's part of a group I'm involved in. And he, he said, sell me a pen. And the real answer to that is what kind of pen are you looking for? You know, there's a million questions that go with that. And great sales trainers, they teach to answer questions with questions. Oh, really, Ryan, I'm curious. What makes you ask that question? I give this analogy all the time, and I'm you'll, you'll love this, I think. This guy walks into Best Buy, and he goes, listen, I'm one of the highest paid programmers in the United States. I need a computer. In this case, I'm going to go with a Microsoft product for what I'm working on. Now, what I'm looking for is a certain type of processor that could handle. I'm looking for a video card that could handle six monitors, blah, 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 blah. And the guy says, I know exactly what you want based on what you told me. He takes him to the computer and he says, this is exactly it. And the guy goes, let me ask you a question. Does that have Windows 10 on it? And he goes, absolutely. The latest version of Windows, Windows 10. He goes, get the hell out of here. You guys are pieces. This is a scam. I hate Windows 10. I can't believe you're a company that would even put Windows 10 on a computer. I'm out of here. The right answer of that, he did everything perfect until he got there. You know what? This comes with a lot of different operating systems. Depending on what our users want, what were you looking for? They've got Geek Squad. They can put anything on it they want. Totally. They want the sale. Great salespeople know how to not put themselves, their backs against the wall and box themselves in. And so what that guy did was by answering yes, he got he fell into the trap rather than saying, well, what makes you ask that question? Can you tell me, you know, what, what's the reason you ask? And then they go, well, 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 you know, and then how many times have you saved yourself from screwing the deal over by doing that? I mean, I have a ton. And then and then, and then you pivot your solution just because, again, you can change it. Super good point. What would you say? Um... So you're managing a set. This is the best question probably of this whole thing. And I think this is so important that we spend some time on this. You know, I, I do this thing called train the trainer. And I always say that you shouldn't have more than five direct reports overall. You should be able to delegate down and mm -hmm. control your day in a way that you're just not having to jump on meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting that you never get to do real work. Mm -hmm. um, but what are some of the metrics? How do you begin to develop the trainer's we're, we're, we're realizing a lot in promotions right now, which we call a promotion of finance, the financing. Um, and once you get someone pre-financed, <laughs> oh, oh my God. Like you, I look at, I've been doing this a long time, 16 years. Financing is everybody says, Oh yeah, I've tried green sky. I've tried this. I've tried that. When you study success, which is a track and roofing and, and windows, they all use financing. So do they, for the, the transmission shops. That's what my dad did for a long time. And um, it's a game changer. So when, when you're training a trainer and you've got a manager, one of the things I've realized is everybody group coaches. They group coach very, very good, but they don't individually coach. They don't give this person, they don't go over their individual stats. You used to be a baseball player. You used to have a baseball card. Did it ever say the team stats or did it say the personal stats? Personal. And then do you have coaches that wanted to coach you personally and make sure 
you, you do better next time yourself. And I think oh. we, we miss that in home service a lot of the time. So talk to me about how to have better meetings. What KPI should we be looking at? What are the mm -hmm. things that really are going to drive? I call it better your best. How do we drive you to become better version of yourself next week? Yeah, love it. I mean, I think there's some core ones that everybody needs to be paying attention to. Um, one is, you know, your closing ratio, right? So um, average ticket size. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know about you guys. Do you guys have a lot of upsell options? Like when you increase deal sizes? Yeah, I got a lot of, I, I don't call them upsells. I, I, you know, people say I don't, I don't sell people anything they don't need. I go, no one needs any of the shit I'm offering. No one needs a garage. No one really even needs a house. What do you mean you don't sell people things they don't need? You sell, that's, that's crap. Losers say I sell things. I don't sell anything anybody doesn't need. Go, go on, go on Facebook right now into a forum with 10,000 plumbers or freaking tile workers. You can count the losers on there saying I don't tell people things they don't need. What do you mean? You, they're options. No one needs a garage door with a video camera on it. People want that because want they want to use it. You want that. Yeah. So you got to – I think you got to look at how, how people are doing with upsells because typically in most businesses, the upsell margin is higher than the base, the base price margin. So you're going to make more money, be able to reward people better by having – looking at deal size and looking at those margins. That's huge. So um, I think the closing ratio is huge. I think, um, you know, sales at the end of the month or end of the week is huge. But what, what really matters is what is the leading activity that creates the end result, right? So what, what kind of proposal volume, prospecting volume, referral generation volume, those types of things, that's going to dictate how you succeed. And then obviously you have training and personal development that folds into that. But I like to see people moving the needle on the process that generates the outcomes we want, which is increased sales by looking at the really the leading indicators versus the lagging indicators of great success. So, so let's go over leading versus lagging. I like, I like this topic. Yeah. So like, you know, prospecting, referral generation, reviews that you're capturing, um, follow-up activity um, and proposals delivered or quotes submitted or estimates submitted, whatever you want to call it. Those are the leading activities, right? If you, I can tell you right now, if a guy's a closing ratio is at 50% and he's, which I think is good. It could be higher. It could be, if it's lower than that, it's in home services, we should be asking why, unless you're a super heavy paid ad company and don't get a lot of referrals, right? So I want to know, if this guy's quoted a million dollars in a month, I'm just throwing out numbers here. And he's closing at 30%. He's going to close 300,000. It's it's already has been closed or it will in the next sales cycle. Um, if he clo if he proposes 250,000 the next month, we're in deep crap, right? We're in bad we're in bad shape. So we got to look at the leading activities. The laggards are, you know, sales, um, you know, margins from those sales, average ticket size and I think another one that I really like to look at is selling cycle. So from either lead to close or proposal to close, what's the average amount of time or days? I think in, you know, in the home service world, obviously we want to have a super short one call possible. Um, we got, we have a lot of clients that do commercial too. So there's a little different environment too. So anyway, thoughts on that? You know, I, I'm thinking about bringing in a warehouse guy into every, one of the things I've realized that that there's not one person listening right now, I don't care how good you are, has not struggled with inventory in the last year. There's been issues. We've all had it. We bought from different vendors. We've done whatever we have to do to survive. And as it's starting to normalize to, you know, there's a new normal now, um, being able to get the door, a warehouse guy to run over, pick up the door, meet the technician and the installer there and start working on it. I think it's the ultimate advantage. I think that time is a huge factor, sometimes more than money. I'll tell you this, and I'm not trying to be cocky here, but but money to me is relative. I want it and I want it quick. I mean, that's why I like Amazon. I ordered these timers, you know, at a gym, you got the remote, it'll, it'll tell you the time, it'll tell you the date, it'll also tell you how long. I just ordered 20 of them for my training center. They're going to be here tomorrow. I was like, hell yeah. And, and that's something I always look at is how long will, is it going to take? Yeah. Um, and customers look at that too. So mastering inventory, 
the byproduct of that is much higher sales. And I talk about bullets. I talk about bullets in your gun. And I think about a six shooter, but maybe we have a 10 shooter. And I talk about, do you have samples? Do you know how to generate the door? Do you know how to get them through the promotional pre-promotions fast? And that comes to operational excellence and running them through here fast and saying, listen, this is not even a hard inquiry. Let's just see what you qualify for real quick. A lot of people don't have to pay anything for over a year, sometimes five years. It's crazy what we do with interest rates the way they are. I mean, in, you know, inflation, gas prices. Let's just see what you qualify for. Once I got them qualified, money's out of the way. And once they have the right stuff, and we're talking about the Harley, they like me. And here's what I say to them every time, Ryan. This is what I would, here's what you need to do. Here's what you should do. But if this were my mom's house, based on what you've told me, that's the key sentence. Based on your staying in the home, you got five kids. You've got four kids on two acres in Hawaii. You got a great ocean. You got a great views. I don't know if it's ocean views. Oh, yeah. Based on what you've told me, here's what, what I would be doing for my mom. Based on what you've told me. And here's why. And then you shut up. And they say, you got to either believe me or not. Now, if you're flipping the house, Ryan, I'm going to say, listen, my mom's flipping this house. Here's exactly. I'm getting it through inspection and I'm making sure there's a good enough warranty because maybe it'll add value when she sells the house. But overall, I care mostly about curb appeal and functionality. You don't need a heavily insulated door. We don't need anything special. We don't need the cameras and all that good stuff. Let's just do this for you and let's get you. This will help you sell the home. And this is what I would do for my mom. And by the way, I love my mom a lot. <laughs> so... I think it's important to throw that in too. So what are your thoughts on that? That's fun, man. It's uh I think it's 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 good. I like it. It's authentic, and, you know, it's everybody can relate to it. And I think that the fact that you're doing pre-qualifying on their financing, I mean, gosh, it just gives the sales guy so much confidence going into the process where all he's got to do is really hear them, connect with them, make sure they like you and feel it, it just I could see this accelerating sales like crazy. Um, it yeah. is nuts. It is nuts because money will never be an option. You both just agreed. You've got pre-finance. It's a small monthly fee. Uh, what are the five pillars of sales transformation? Yeah, we do an evaluation and analyze our team or the individual salespeople. We actually do an analysis. Uh, we partner with a company out of Boston, a sales analysis. And we have seen over 1,900 salespeople take it since we started the company. And um, on average, the way we score them is based on sales competencies. 55% of salespeople are actually considered what we would standardize as weak, which means they're really just order takers. They're not really great salespeople. That's based on the will to sell, their desire, their commitment, their learning, their, their beliefs, their, their supporting or sabotaging great sales success, and then sales competencies and sales skills. So we measure 21 core competencies and we measure first and then we set a foundation leadership wise pillar two let's create a great foundation for sales success and then uh what we want to do is help them compensation sales plan crm and a kickoff event so we're a big believer that like every company should not hey let's bring in ryan groth for a day which is awesome you know i could come in and make an impact what we want to do is we want to transform empower and give the tools for the leader and leaders in the organization to put on their own sales event multiple times a year that makes it exciting for sales reps to be a part of and be invested into so i don't know what your dynamics like but like my best clients do multiple internal sales trainings a year they're using my platform but they're actually the teachers and facilitators of the training themselves they're not needing somebody else on the outside to come in and do it for them so it for you know that's a key piece and then pillar three is professionalization of the sales force so obviously technology sales enablement ongoing coaching like athletes get ongoing coaching and then we're big on automation and uh we like to see camaraderie uh you know being automated so things like slack channels and when deals are closed and leaderboards and scoreboards we want to create a automated camaraderie environment so that I grew up watching Sports Center three times a day. I don't know about you, but I watched it twice. Like I saw the same episode twice. I just loved it, you know? And you're always looking at numbers, always looking at the league leaders, always looking at the top 10 plays. I want to create companies in this home services world 
that feels like you're living in this in sports center. You're like in a league, you're in a team. It's constantly feeling like you can perform because that peer pressure, that desire to be great is, is embedded in the organization and it makes people rise up and the true performers rise up. And then, okay. fifth, you know, fifthly, we love, uh, yeah, yeah. Just so yeah. Fifthly is our own live events. So just, um, in camaraderie and in community, uh, at, you know, <clears throat> within our client base, but go ahead. You had something you wanted to add. Well, I was just thinking there, you know, gamification is huge. Letting people know the score. You know, I always say the manuals, the processes are how we play the game. The KPIs are the scoreboard. And every single morning I have at least four guys talking about their big wins from the day before. And they're always different. Mm. And we get what's super cool about it is you get to hear it from the horse's mouth. Mm hmm. It's just super cool because you hear about the slam dunks, the 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 home runs with the triple double. It's just crazy when you really get into it, what these guys are doing and the acknowledgement. I interviewed my top three guys for another podcast that I'm launching. And every single one of them, I said, why do you guys stay with me? Of course, you make great money. And I think we got good camaraderie. But they said, you know, Tommy, the, the real deal is we get recognized here. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a spot to grow. We know that, but more than anything, we're competing with hundreds of people and we like to win and we like to be noticed and totally. you give that to us. And you guys, you, you, you really let us talk at the meetings and you really cherish our opinions. And when we have a feedback, you either say, no, and here's why yes, but not now, or yes, let's implement that right away. And I think that that's important that most They've got a relationship with me. I just went out to lunch with one of with the top guy in the company, number one guy in our whole company. And he's like, you know, I just I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to move into a certain role. And he asked me about it. I said, absolutely. And he said, well, there's a couple other managers that said. Um, probably wasn't the best spot for me. I said, well, here's what I'll tell them. Just like any other position in the company, I'd like people to try out. And I like to do what I call ride-alongs. And I like to do a self-evaluation for them. And I like to do a lot of things. And I said, if we have tryouts for every role, including CSRs, dispatchers, technicians, installers, we'll have a tryout for this role. And the opportunity of not getting the right person in this role is millions of dollars of EBITDA for me per year per person. Because it's an important role. They're closers. And I said, do you feel comfortable competing for that position against other people? He said, well, you know, I'm going to win. I said, I know. So if I made that happen, would you be a happy camper? And he said, yes, that would mean the world to me. And I said, okay, well, this is what I'm willing to do. And I'll get you an answer by Friday. Does that work? Because I think everybody should compete. I'm big into competition. I'm big into sports. I played a lot of sports. One thing I noticed at sports is sometimes I practice eight to nine times a week to play one game. We do two a days for football. Right. I mean, literally soccer, baseball. I was wrestler. I played golf. You name it. And the deal was with me is um, I love to practice. Practice was just as fun. Totally. And I knew I had to practice if I wanted to play. I couldn't miss practice. The, the coach wouldn't let us play. And that, you know what I love? What I just said, though, Ryan, is is I, I'm a coach. And I, you know what I remember about all my coaches? They love me. They cared for me. They, they'd bring me dinner if I didn't eat. And my mom couldn't show up. They'd drive me home. You know what a manager is? Piece of shit with a coffee cup that's trying to manage my ass, trying to get the best out of me. Doesn't really care. Doesn't really want to work hard. Just make me do whatever. I think really badly of a manager. I think amazingly of a coach. What do you think? Yeah, love it. That's it. I was a football, baseball guy, man. And, you know, what makes, dude, like the most honoring award I got was in junior college, my sophomore year. I had just gotten drafted. I was D1 scholarship. Dude, the freaking team voted on the MVP. And they voted me. Like goosebumps. That means you res you earn the respect of the entire team. And that means you're recognized by everybody else. And, um, you know, 67% of people are intrinsically motivated. Um, and... When you think about how many people are intrinsically motivated, Tommy, like that doesn't mean they're 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 there working just so they can buy a Lambo or whatever. They're there to feel part of something bigger. They feel noticed and recognized. 
I mean, why do people work so hard uh, to win the MVP? I mean, they're not necessarily getting, they're probably getting a bonus financially, but what they're getting is the respect of the entire league. And when you can function like that, it's, it's pretty powerful. So just fostering an environment of recognition, spotlights, letting people share, man, it's so cool to see people empowered and stepping into who they truly are. And that's the amazing thing as owners, we get a chance to do is, is create that environment. So being an, being an athlete, um, growing up and having coaches coaches who I knew really cared about my success and they invested, then I could take personal, I could take feedback really well when I knew they loved, you know, they, they cared about me. They, they tell me X, Y, Z and, you know, they, and I'm experiencing that with my kids right now. They're, they're growing up. We're starting to push them now to get into that age where I can really push, you know, it's not mommy, you know, nurturing them as much. It's more dad, dad uh, development. It's powerful. So, I think a lot, another thing too, Tommy, and I'm getting a little on a rabbit trail here, but no, I love it. Listen, I can go, we, we can go. Can you go maybe 15 more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Just um, making sure you didn't have a hard stop. I, I, it's, it's not hard, but I get, I, I definitely can be a little late. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, Tommy, like, I don't know about you, bro. I'm going on a rabbit trail here, but what's the percentage of people our age? We're probably in our 30s. I'm in my 30s, probably 30s or 40s. What percentage of people in our generation? Yeah. Right. What's the percentage of people in our generation who's who's uh, who who came out of a divorce home? I did. I think it's probably in the seventy percent. I mean, seriously. So you think about like what does a company or a team and a coach provide that they didn't get? Right. Leadership. You know, guidance, environment. It's freaking nuts. And like they, a lot of people that they find, they find so much identity working in a great culture. So what we have as leaders is a, is a real responsibility to the shape of place where they're probably, if not, they've never experienced anything like this before, where they're a part of a team, they're recognized for their achievements, their systems, processes, they're invested into people of authority figures in their life are believing in them. Dude, some people never have that. And they crave that and they need that. And we are their parents. And I've realized that I've taken on fatherhood without fatherhood. Um, yeah. you, you know, I think there's something to be said here that I think is a great tip for listeners out there. If you get your people to present to you, you give them their KPIs. Now you have everything in advance and you make sure that their numbers are accurate. And you have them tell the, it's so much more important when it comes out of their mouth. And they say that they want it. And when you learn... I've, I've hired a dream manager, so I'm learning what, what my people's goals and dreams are, what motivates them, what goes down to the root cause of why they're even working. Well, I work to put food on the table. Why? Because I got to buy that. Blah, blah. But you get down to the roots and really figure out what's going to make them happy. Think outside of the box and then really understand that and have that on a piece of paper and say, listen, you wanted to take your mom on a trip that you never got to go on. You wanted to take her somewhere. You told me you wanted to take your dad fishing. That's a quick trip. That's only a three-day event. You told me you want to put your kids in private school. I know, Ryan, what motivates you, and I know what motivates me. So listen, as you're presenting here, you told me last week that you wanted this, what it was going to take to get you there. So let's just discuss this together. And you tell me what we're missing here, because when they're presenting and they're the ones telling you, and then they sign up on the bottom saying, I'm going to do everything in my power to make this happen. The conversations are not as pushy. You're going, listen, man, I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this because I'm here to work by your side to get you what you told me you want. It reverses everything you thought was a tough conversation. Like, hey, listen, we need to have a talk. Those talks do not become the same type of talks. It's literally like, well, tell me again why you're here. Tell me again why you work here. Tell me again what your goals are because I got them written down here. Tell me again what we went over last week. And they present to you. Then all of a sudden at the end, you say, listen, I know we can do better than this because you want it. And I know one thing. We get you on one ride along this week. You promise me to give me every note of what you learned because I want to share it with everybody. And I want you to talk about the balls we're going to break through this week. And I think a great coach could move. You look at Mike Tyson. I watched something with him yesterday. He was crying, talking about the guy that found him in high school said, you're going to be the world champ. And Mike Tyson was shit back then. He collected pigeons. He was nothing. 
He turned him into a world champion that could rival none, I don't think. You know, I got a picture of Bubba, Bubba Douglas knocking him out here because I think Bubba Douglas died. His mom died right before that. So he told his mom, I'm going to win for you. So he got back up and knocked Mike Tyson out because he figured out his why. But, um, wow. you know, that, that's that's just a little tip I have that people, they, it's very hard to have tough conversations. They feel like they're going to lose people. They say, man, if I confront this guy, he's a prima donna. He, he can call the shots he's threatened to leave before. But see, I just see what we did there, Ryan. We, we No one wants to leave if I'm helping you accomplish your goal. If I'm smiling and having a really good conversation with you, it's not very confrontational. It takes all the hard work and all the, the, the pain out of it, doesn't it? Totally. Yeah, I mean, what athlete has ever been wildly successful and never credited the coach or the father or the mother that pushed them way beyond what they thought they can do, right? Phil and, Jackson. Uh, yeah. So I think it's super powerful. And I've been on the other side where I've waterboarded people, dude. I put me and a couple managers and reamed a guy, you know, and it didn't it didn't land. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. People are what's in it for me. And if you can bring it back to what's in it for me in every meeting and remind them why and actually talk with 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 care, like you really love that person or care about them and, and you're yeah. looking out for them. Now, I know the byproduct of everybody hitting their dreams is I accomplish mine which is so cool that we could celebrate together because if I'm winning, there's one thing, Ryan, that I'm very, very clear. This is not a sport. So when I win, doesn't mean you have to lose. And my competitors that come in here, I say, guys, you're more than welcome. Just because I'm winning doesn't mean you're losing. And I think it's important to know that it doesn't need to be winners and losers. I'm a competitive SOB. So yes, I want to be the largest, but that doesn't mean for your lifestyle, you're not happy. Look, there's 7 million people in Houston. There, there's 5 million people here in Phoenix. There's enough clients for all of us. <laughs> totally. Uh, I'll, I want to start wrapping up here because you do have a stop. What are uh, I want to reach out to you. I want to learn more about sales. How do I get a hold of you? Yeah, just go to sales transformation group.com. You'll speak to one of our teammates and they'll connect. You could book a call. We have some resources there. Um, if you don't want to do that, just go right at it. By the way, I'm the type that just goes right at it. Uh, but if you're not that way, you can check out, you know, LinkedIn or YouTube sales transformation group. My LinkedIn is Ryan Groth. Just look me up. Um, Facebook, I'm pretty much max on friends. So it's hard to like, you know, connect on the Facebook, but just follow me on Instagram. You know, if you want to get to know me a little bit more, um, share stuff on family, life, faith, business, it's kind of a little bit of a more personal expression. And, um, and yeah, I mean, and we, we, I'm speaking at conferences pretty regularly and likely to do that. We actually, uh, we have a couple of events this year. One's virtual in, um, April and one is, uh, in Dallas at the four seasons in October is our main flagship event. So a lot of chances for us to get to know each other. How often do you get to Phoenix? Um, probably once a year. Yeah. All right. I'll connect with you. Uh, on a side note on that, um, what um, what's your three favorite books other than like E-Myth and some of the, the classics like um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad and and uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People? There's some out there that everybody chooses. So just maybe some different ones. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I, was, I, I loved both of those books I mentioned earlier that you mentioned Ideal Team Player and the Emotional Intelligence 2.0 is really good. Um, one of them that really just kind of gets you to like this gritty place of selling is uh, Og Mandino's The Greatest Salesman in the World. It's a is short. That the, uh, is that the car salesman one? No, he's a rug so a rug guy. He's selling rugs. Um, no, that's not it. Yeah, The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. Dude, that book will that book will get you feeling good. It's a good one. I uh, love that book. Um, yeah, those are a couple top of mind. I, I love good to great. That's obviously, a, you know, a pretty well-known one classic, um, baseline selling is one that we, we lean into a ton, um, sales process there. And yeah, it's definitely a, a bunch of them, but those are top of mind right now. All right. I'm going to pass five of these out if they make it here by tomorrow on thursday they're cheap they're like six bucks um and then 
Here's what I always do. I'll let you close this out. Go for now is a great book. Yeah, that you got to put that in your arsenal. It's a very simple read. It's it's short. Um, we talked about a lot. I didn't get to all the questions. I'm sorry. We'll have to do a two, 2 on here to the podcast, but you know, a lot of people out there, they don't know how to get started. Sales sometimes to them is a bad word. We talked about a lot of stuff, but, uh, I'm going to give you a few minutes to close us out on anything you think that the audience should hear that we didn't get to. Yeah, guys. I mean, look, like I have this behind me to remind me all the time that you're either growing or you're dying. Um, don't go backwards by not taking action. And it's one thing to hear a bunch of information. It's another thing to take action. So my, my favorite thing is to take iterative action every single day and to get to continue to move the ball down the field. Don't look backwards. Don't stay stuck. Get unstuck ASAP. Uh, surround yourself with people who've been there before you because if you're hanging around Tommy and you, you know, you enjoy Tommy and hear what he's saying and you, you've heard one or two things he's doing, and then you're like, wow, like if he can do it, like, and he just told me how he did it and he, then I can do it. Um, learn how to learn and believe and start to learn how to believe in yourself. Um, that's what's going to take you to the next level. And I think knowing, knowing why you do what you do. If you're saying, I know my why, but my, and I enjoy just staying a uh, less than a million dollar a year and doing all the work. Like to me, you're not really serving a bigger picture because you're not able to help a lot of people and you're not, you're sure as heck on giving your family the time that you, that they deserve. Um, if all you're doing is working 12 hour days, six days a week. And so have a huge idea of what you want to do. Think, realize success is growth. Don't go backwards. Um, really have a deep, if, if pain is your motivation and moving away from pain, then, then that's fine. But work on growth all the time, never stop because you're going to be way more fulfilled than you are just saying, Hey, I make a few hundred grand a year. I'm happy. No, dude. Like, look, if I told you you make 200 grand or uh, 2 million a year in the next two months, or I'm sorry, two years, and you're able to help a hundred more people give to your charity, spend time with your family. Would you really want to, would you really want to stay and just be happy there? Like, would you really want to do that? Bro, Life can get so much better. And we got one shot. YOLO. We got one. We only live once. We got one chance here to do something awesome. Don't go to don't go to bed wait, uh, regretting that you didn't go for it. Go big or go home. If you're going to do it, freaking do it for real and build something special because there are a lot of people. And then look, it doesn't mean it's it's harder per se, if you're like, oh, I got to do 10 million and I'm a million and doing it the exact same way you're doing it now. Yeah, that's going to be way harder. You'll never do it, but it's harder in a different way. And when you realize that the game of business um, is a combination of belief, information, and really action, then and you can learn anything. And as long as you're, you're hungry for it, I think that's, that's key. So Tommy, I'm inspired by just how much your action you've taken and how you're dominating your niche. It's really awesome. And, uh, you know, I think more people need to realize, man, if Tommy's doing $400,000 days, I should at least do a $400,000 a month in the next couple of years. Let's go. And um, that's yeah. effing go, man. Let's effing go. That's the deal. That's the deal. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. LFG, bro. You know, I was letting you finish and you were going to end it, but I'll tell you, that was motivating. And the people out there, you got to reverse engineer. You got to have a plan. You can't just say, I want to grow. I want to be profitable. I want to work less. That's bullshit. You need to find out where you want to go. I want to do a billion. I need 2,000 technicians. Now I need 1,600 technicians because my sales has gone up. As my tickets start to go up, I'll probably need 1,200 because parts are up, inflation's up, gas is up, I charge more. We're getting into selling up, selling call, whatever you want. But 1,200 technicians, how do I... I will be able to recruit by the end of summer over 100 technicians a month. Have the trucks ready. I know exactly the fractions I need of CSRs, the dispatchers, to text. And it's scary to me because it's so freaking easy now. But it was so hard to get here. I I don't know if I could rebuild it like it's built now because the processes, I, I probably could, but the people are what make it, man. And I'll tell you, it's just, it's crazy. Like the shit I'm learning now, it gets me, it gets me to do a cartwheel. You know, I'm like, dude, I, I do some flippy shit and I get excited, dude. I was on the dance floor. I was officiating a wedding on Saturday and I'm doing cartwheels and 
back handsprings and God knows flips and kips. And, and I'm just like living the best life ever. And I got to tell you, it's exciting. I'm like, holy shit. We change this, 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 hire this, do this, train like this. That's a million dollars a day. That's that's a million dollars a day. And I'm just getting started. People go, yeah, th there's no way you can do a billion in that industry. I go, not with your market cap because your market cap is based on history. My market cap is built on the future. I don't give a shit. You can't put me in a box. You know, if you look around your normal circle, and you don't get inspired. It's a cage is what I tell people. And I don't live in a cage. Love so it. we got to hang out, my brother. Definitely, man. Hey, Absolutely. go to your meeting, man. I appreciate you uh, you, no. you coming here today. Hey, and have, your again. have your people talk to my people after this. Let's do it. Thanks. <laughs> See you later, Ryan. Take it easy. Bye.